corruption and the ways to avoid that. And he also uh, wrote for the Dow Jones Newswire and CNBC in the States. Uh, we discussed also briefly Turkey and Greece. That's a long story and an interesting story. And he very frequently goes to Greece. He's, he's almost Greek, I think. And he also writes that he told me he was the only Turkish columnist in a Greece, Greek newspaper. And that was called Katina Vini. And finally, another important topic that we will discuss, I hope, he also uh, has been associated with an organization that tries to get in touch with Armenia. It was by a lonely university organization that he traveled to Yerevan. So he's someone who is taking care of the neighbors, and now he's with us. So I think that was enough of uh, the appetizer. Now we will get the real meal. Right, and we will set up the Bima. He will start with a few pictures, and then he will give his presentation, and then we'll start the discussion. With that, I welcome again Bula Thank you. This is uh, Ankara, the year is 1970. Uh, the gentleman at the far right is my father, whom I lost four years ago. Uh, standing next to him is an Iranian gentleman, a doctor actually, and it's, it's there by the seven. And the bride next to him is a Turkish lady. And next to the bride is my mother, whom I also lost along with my father four years ago. And the two other couples are also ordinary Turkish couples. Uh, all of the people you, you, you see in this picture are, apart from the, the Iranian groom, were Turkish. I should say, low-class minor civil servants. So please keep that in mind. I'm not talking about an aristocratic family, an urbanized family, or not. I'm not trying to be an elitist here. So the next picture is a school theater. This is Izmir. The year is 1976. This is pure play acting, but uh, the main character here is this little boy that you see over there. His hair and moustache and hat and glasses and his dog is me when I was 10 years old. Play acting, the main character of the, the, the uh, play. A certain Moiz, which is, I guess, still a common name among Turkey's Jews. So here, I'm talking about a government school, a primary school, graduation ceremony, a screenplay uh, acted by, by the students, 10 or 11 years old students, including myself. The main character is a certain Moise uh, that hangs around uh, villages and towns 
with this benevolent wisdom. We got thundering applause at the end of the play, I remember still very well. The sad thing is, that was the year 1976, and I, I, I bet if anyone dared to do the same today, in, in, in the year 2011, either that school could have been bombed, the characters assassinated, or better still, uh, the schoolmaster would have been fired by the government. If you are curious about why I'm so con uh, confident about that, here's another school play of recent years. So instead of this, what we did uh, 35 years ago, this is what the Turkish youth are doing today. <coughs> this is from another school theater scene in what I call the New Turkey. I don't need to explain the main theme of the play, I guess. It's very apparent what these students are trying to express themselves in. Another school theatre in the New Turkey. And another. And another. And this one is uh, a shot from Turkish students' performance in Germany. Happily, the Turkish and German friends stand together. And these are the students, though in Turkey, in Germany, from what I call the new Turkey. Another student's performance, and another. This one is different though. This is a performance of students at the kindergarten. <coughs> Mind you, if anyone is curious why these children are being forced to wear the headscarf, the religious explanation is that. Uh, although it's, it's not in the Quran, it's not commanded in the Quran at all, if anyone has fully read the Quran, uh, he would have noticed. Where the, the, the justification for wearing the, the forceful wearing of the, the, the headscarf is, is that if a piece of hair, female hair, is to be seen uh, by the opposite sex, that might sexually arouse the person in question. And here, as you see, we're talking about three or four year old kindergarten children being forced to wear the headscarf. So this should give you an idea about uh, mentality. Uh, as I told you, I'm not trying to be elitist by showing you the pictures of, of, of the wedding ceremony attended by, by my parents and uh, their friends, but they were simply the average Turkish uh, low to medium class people, civil servants, and they were Turkish parents in the year 1970. And this is a picture of the Turkish parents today. So here they are. To prove to you that I'm not really trying to be an editor, uh, my late father, when he died, he was living on uh, a government pension of what is today an equivalent of 300 euros per month. So around the same time I was uh, play-acting boys in that screenplay at our graduation ceremony. This gentleman uh, was struggling for what he saw was his justified cause. This is early 70s, President Abdullah Kuhn. This is what I call the days of national vision, the, the official ideology that Turkey's rulers today uh, come from. One thing is specific 
Uh, at that time, these gatherings, demonstrations, were considered rather marginal by the average Turk. And they featured quite religious elements, <coughs> fiercely aligned with what they called as the Palestinian coast, and naturally featuring lots of anti-Israeli, anti-Semitic elements. And these demonstrations, one, one, one uh, very particularly, very frequently witnessed placard, for example, at these demonstrations, uh, which were considered to be, you know, aligned with our brothers, Palestinians, or standing against Israel meetings, it was a particular pl placard that, that always read one line, and that, that said, now I understand it. So, the present of today's Turkey is coming from that tradition. The gentleman on the right hand side is his Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan and the Lord, the warlord rather, sitting in, in the middle is no other than Bülbettin Ekmetyar. He's a very well known, uh, probably one of the most brutal leaders of Afghanistan's Islamic movements. He founded Hizban Islam which means the party of Islam in 1975 in Afghanistan. So here in the spot of, in Istanbul, in mid-80s, uh, who will one day become Turkey's Prime Minister, is paying his respects to this Afghan warlord, who in February 2003 was designated by the United States as a global terrorist. And this last picture, I'm sure, won't surprise anyone here. This is from uh, one of the millions of demonstrations of its time. It says, we'll fight our struggle till Israel has been wiped off the map. This is what the placard says. And what is important here is, is that uh, more or less the same age that I was playacting Moise in that screenplay, my graduation ceremony in 1976. Uh, boys at the same age are being forced, brainwashed by their fathers to take place at the front row of this demonstration, whatever it was against, but we know what the main theme is here, to annihilate Israel. So that is the difference between uh, primary school children and their parents 35 years ago and today. Many years ago, somewhere in Huntington uh, set out three strategic options about Turkey's future. The first one was EU membership. The second one was a break off with secularism and a return to the Islamic world that Turks once ruled. And the third one was political isolation built on a bizarre kind of nationalistic sentiment. first option, uh, EU membership. 
we don't have any evidence that it will materialize anytime soon or whether it will materialize ever. When Turkey stands today, also rules out uh, Kondalisa Rice's fourth option that Turkey should always remain anchored uh, at a Western Bay if the EU failing, that Western Bay being uh, America. We can hardly be convinced today that this is really the situation. But then, uh, there is a fifth option, which I have named the fifth option, which is a bizarre blend of Huntington's second and third options, strategic options for Turkey, which is a blend of uh, a break off with secularism and, and a return to the Islamic world, and political isolation, or emerging political isolation, built on a nationalistic sentiment. This is where really today is Turkey is, is heading for, and I know that the, sh the shortcut answer to the question where Turkey really is, is, is heading for. Uh, the easiest thing that, to say is that it is heading for an unpleasant territory, an uncharted, but predictable, rather unpleasant territory. But how and where and why? This former academic, the Professor Ahmed Daoutoul, as his chief foreign policy advisor, got so much influenced by his ideas, then made him the foreign minister of Turkey two years ago, and then both of them drifting into what I call the dreamland of reviving Turkey's colonialist near Ottoman past. Uh, there may be some reasons for. Uh, this venture, but I, I'd rather argue that, that why this is happening falls into not really the discipline of, of, of international politics or political science, but rather psychiatry. Dream, 
like Martin Luther King's is that one day we would all happily pray at the al aqsa Mosque in the Palestinian capital, Al-Quds. So, we have a Prime Minister, all powered by our all too powerful Prime Minister, who doesn't hide that his dream is that we all one day pray at the al aqsa Mosque at Al-Quds, which is the Palestinian capital, and in our own city. So, where do we stand today in terms of these uh, zero problems with neighbors policy terms? I'll tell you. Today, the names Dawood Olu or, or, or Erdogan must be the last names that Syrian President Al-Assad would wish to hear rather than just seeing them. Uh, I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, Turkey is going through at increasingly tension of terms with Iran, especially after it agreed to host an expand NATO radar that would intercept uh, any missile threat from particularly Iran, although it doesn't mention the name Iran. Uh, but relations with, with Iran are not good. Relations with Syria completely frozen. Relations with neighboring northern Iraq are very bad because of the escalation of violence from the PKK and Turkey's military response to that. Uh, the, the, the protocols with Armenia, which we signed two years ago, are now in the waste basket. So they're completely gone. Nothing new on that front. Uh, there's a lot of tension on the Aegean with Greece and more than with Greece, there's a lot of tension to Turkey's south with Cyprus and together with Cyprus with Israel. Recently, Prime Minister Erdogan threatened to increase Turkey's naval presence in the eastern Mediterranean for two reasons. Uh, A, that the Turkish frigates and corvettes and fighter jets would accompany any humanitarian aid flotilla like the Mahdi Manga that would be bound for the Gaza Strip and be to, to discourage any company that on the will of the Cypriots or of the Israelis or both of the Cypriots and Israelis would do, would conduct any exploration work for hydrocarbons off the coast of Cyprus in the Mediterranean. And our EU Minister, Yemen Bash, recently said that regarding uh, Turkey's intentions to, to, to send, which I call the, the battleship diplomacy today, instead of zero problems with neighbors diplomacy, uh, naval fleets and fighter jets and all that to the Mediterranean basin. His explanation in a very threatening tone, which naturally was perceived as threatening in Athens, that this is why we have a navy. This is what our uh, chief negotiator with the EU said. But funny enough, okay, I understand this is a miracle that, that Turkey has become the only country in the world that is today at very bad relations at the same time with Syria, with Iran and Israel. Okay, that's a big word. But there's, there's something funnier in Turkey's regional polity that uh, if you read one US cable quoted by Wikileaks, uh, actually quoting Azeri President Bilham Aliyev as, as saying that Azerbaijan, which Turks think uh, is a brotherly country that we are actually in the Turkish thinking, uh, we are one nation, two states. This is the standard cliche reference to, to Azerbaijan in Turkey. So, uh, Aliyev tells the American ambassador at that time that uh, all his country hopes to do is to protect itself from Turkey's neo-Ottomanism and Islamism. So, this is another miracle that Turkey in, imagine making nemesis neighbors Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, 
feeling equally distant to Turkey at the same time should be another form of also miracle. But uh, where do all these miracles come from? They, what, what, what is their source? Their source is uh, a book called Strategic Death, published in 2011 by that academic scholar, Professor Davutoglu, who is now Turkey's foreign minister. Uh, I guess he, he made a strategic mistake in, in arguing that. Uh, and I don't know why some people, especially Western people, uh, are trying to look convinced by his arguments, because some of his arguments expressed in that book look rather childish to me, and, and I'm sure some of the other people in our audience today, they will look so. Uh, for example, in, in this masterpiece of a book, uh, which I guess explains part of the reasons why uh, the Turkish government prefers, uh, intentionally prefers, tense relations with Israel, with the state of Israel, is, is in Dautou's explanation, if you read the book, you would find a passage that says uh, the, the extended cooperation agreements between Turkey and the state of Israel in, in, in the mid and late 90s are to the detriment of Turkey because they help legitimize Arab nationalism. So this is the idea that was all expressed in his book. But then we have we can have like a hundred counter questions to, to, to challenge this idea. Because his argument is that when a predominantly Muslim but non-Arab, so this part is important, a predominantly Muslim and non-Arab country has close relations with the state of Israel, this will produce further justification for the next wave of Arab nationalism. This is his idea. So, in a way, Davutoglu was giving, uh, 10 years ago, was giving the message that if he is one day at the helm of the, the Turkish foreign policy. He would do that because he wants to avoid the next wave of Arab nations. But this thinking uh, looks crippled in many ways. So my questions would be, why should, for example, Arab nationalism gain momentum only because a predominantly Muslim but non-Arab country signed cooperation agreements with Israel? Why should this happen? Would the Arabs have hated nationalism on a satirist Palimus basis, but embrace it the moment, for instance, let's say, Indonesia, which is a, a predominantly Muslim but non-Arab country, let's say, if, if it signed cooperation agreements with Israel? Would the Arabs uh, in Jordan, Palestine, embrace nationalism because Indonesia signed cooperation agreements with Israel? It doesn't look logical to me. And why the description predominantly Muslim but non-Arab country. Why? I don't understand that. Does that mean the Arabs would, would shun nationalism if predominantly Muslim and Arab countries sign cooperation agreements with Israel? But if non-Arab but Muslim countries sign that would be a problem and provoke Arab nationalism? I, I really don't see the linkage between but this was the, the idea expressed in Dautoglu's book. And it is in a way uh, accepting the religious thinking in making foreign policy because this gentleman is telling us that if a predominantly Muslim but non-Arab country has signed cooperation agreements with Israel, that would provoke Arab nationalism. He doesn't say that if such a country signed cooperation agreements with Israel, uh, sorry, not Israel, but if, if, if they signed cooperation agreements with, with the Christian, Shintoist, Buddhist, whatever atheist countries, that wouldn't be a problem. But Arab nationalism is there waiting for a predominantly Muslim but non-Arab country to sign agreements with Israel to embrace its nationalist self. It's, it's not convincing at all. Because there are many good reasons that this, this argument is, is 
uh, truly crippled from the beginning because at the peak of Arab nationalism against Israel, I'm talking about late 60s, 70s and onward, Turkey even did not have full diplomatic relations with Israel. And Arab, Arab nationalism has had many good reasons of its own to exist rather than whether Turkey signs cooperation agreements with, with Israel or not. Uh, for instance, it rose to its prominence, Arab nationalism, with the collapse of the, the, the Ottoman Empire at a time when the state of Israel did not even exist. So, what is this man that would always trying to tell us? And what are the parallels between his thinking and Ahmadinejad's thinking, for example? It's very simple. If you trace out the public statements, uh, they're actually talking about the same generic theme in two different ways, with two different goals. The basic difference between the rhetorics of Ahmadinejad and the Otoo is that the Iranian talks about no Israel at all in plain language, whereas the milder, quote unquote, Turk, the Otoo, talks about a smaller Israel and in subtle language. And to achieve the goal of no Israel, the radical Ahmadinejad resorts to bombs that he says he's not building. And for his smaller Israel goal, the ostensibly moderate Mr. Daoudou resorts to politics, which he thinks can uh, make it perfectly instrumental if he revives Turkey's Ottoman past. This is uh, what we call is the raison d'etre for his uh, new Ottomanism. So, as evidenced by, by, by daily events and, and Turkey's present relations with its neighbors, uh, Davutoglu's zero problems with neighbors' policy uh, has either been fake from the beginning or it's a complete failure. But as the, as the millionaire Oscar concludes at the end of the classic film, Some Like It Hot, when he discovers that the girl he has just become engaged to is a man. Well, nobody is perfect. One trouble about Dovotolo's policy is, is, is uh, the self aggrandizing element in, in, in Turkish foreign policy making. He somehow views Turkey's powers, say, a hundred times more than they actually are, and he Yes, he, he puts Turkey's influence and powers under a magnifier. And he puts Turkey's uh, potential and, and, and potential powers and influence under a magnifier. Uh, I have to quote you another uh, leak, another classified US State Department cable published by WikiLeaks quoting former U.S. Ambassador to Ankara, Jeff, James Jeffrey, as reporting back to uh, Washington. This line, I guess, which explains the self-aggrandizing behavior of the Otoro's policy. So, Ambassador Jeffrey wrote back to Washington that, with Rolls-Royce ambitions, but drawer resources to cut themselves in on the action, the Turks have to cheat by finding an underdog a Sinasic, a Mesha, or an Ahmadinejad. So this explains the core of uh, what I call the Davutoglu uh, dreamland. So, as we all know, Turkey was the first Muslim country to recognize the State of Israel at its inception in, in 1949. But six decades later, Turkey's leaders think it was a big mistake. And, but why is that? My argument is, 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 is that there is simply a mathematics of politics behind the ostensibly complex transformation of 
Turkish Israeli ties from strategic and friendly less than two decades ago to call for terms of deep hostility today. The reason the, the, the mathematics of politics here is, is that Turkey has lost its secular polity and Israel has lost Turkey. It's as simple as that. As, as President Shimon Peres told me in 2006, uh, quoting him, when holiness begins, reason ends. So in Turkey, holiness began and reason ended. In the last two decades, Turkey's socio-political demography has radically changed in favor of religious and ethnic conservatism. And in, uh, for example, June this year, nearly three quarters of Turks voted for either Islamist, neo-Islamist or ethnically nationalistic parties, with the secular Turks accounting for only one quarter of the national vote. So this is where we stand today. And since he came to power in November 2002, Erdogan has felt Turkey's secular regime and challenged laws that strictly separate religion, especially from the public sphere and politics. His increasing popularity, especially among the observant Turks, and especially in the Anatolian heartland, uh, has enabled him to defeat secularism through perfectly democratic means by winning votes, and that's it. But the new demise of Turkey's secularism has also revived Erdogan's political genes dating back to the early 70s when he was a militant business, as those, some of those pictures I, in, in, in some of those pictures I tried to explain to you. So, the trouble about foreign policy making uh, we're talking about basically two gentlemen, Davutoglu and Erdogan. No other man is so much directly involved in foreign policy making in Turkey. In the past it used to be the military or the state establishment, but these days not even the, the foreign ministry or diplomats, but it, it's Erdogan and Davutoglu. So let's try to understand uh, his thinking and how he has faith, religion, as a, as a lens through which he views world affairs, including domestic and foreign policy. Back in January 2009, Erdogan said in a broken Turkish, which was unusual for him because he's a great orator and as you know, he's an imam by profession. He said that he was approaching the Middle East issue with a Muslim's approach. This is what we say, I'm approaching the Middle East issue with a Muslim's approach. This is where the, the, the real danger is, and, and, and this is really where, why we are standing, wherever we are standing today. Hostilities with Israel, failed friendships with these Arab countries, etc. So at that time, uh, I argued in one of my articles that. Uh, Erdogan claiming to be an honest broker between Syria and Israel and at the same time admitting that he's approaching the Middle East with a Muslim's approach is like, uh, let's say, the, the Archbishop of the Church of Greece saying that with his uh, approach to the Cyprus problem with an orthodox approach is an honest broker to the Cyprus dispute between the Turks and the Greeks. So, from the beginning, it was an illusion if anyone bought it or, or, or believed that he really approached the Arab Israeli conflict uh, from a neutral point of view. No, he had better think so. He had uh, the Muslims' approach in what basically was uh, a Muslim Jewish conflict. We might uh, find better names in this country, Arab Israel. But as I've been trying to explain, it is a religious school. So let's try to understand his, his thinking. According to, to, to Erdogan, again quoting his, his various statements here, in this part of, of my, my presentation. Uh, according to Erdogan, Muslims don't commit genocide. He said that 
in defense of Omar Bashir, the leader of Sudan, uh, wanted by court warrant, an international court warrant, for crimes against humanity. Again, according to Mr. Erdogan, Muslims don't kill. Muslims don't resort to terrorism. Muslims don't tell lies. They don't cheat. And one more thing. Muslims, he once told a group of journalists, Muslims don't build nuclear weapons. I wasn't there, but I would have the reflex of asking him if I had been there, asking Erdogan if Pakistan was a Catholic state. But nobody asked him, because they couldn't dare, for reasons probably you might guess. Uh, but one of Erdogan's favorite statements is his famous line that there is no Islamic terror, although Google might give you, I once tried and it gave me 9.5 million results, but he says this concept, Islamic terror, doesn't exist. And it was funny, uh, there's this online humor magazine newspaper in Turkey, ironically called Zaytun, and in response to, to Erdogan's statement that there is no Islamic terror, they ran a story on their website whose lead paragraph was this. So this is a fabricated story in this humor online magazine. Erdogan's claims that there is no Islamic terror have left several Islamic terror organizations heartbroken. A statement from Al-Qaeda's press section read, The Prime Minister's remarks are very discouraging. We are doing our best. <laughs> now I'm going to read out three quotes from Erdogan. Quote 1. The killings of Uyghur Turks by the Chinese police during demonstrations constitute genocide. I use this term intentionally, the Prime Minister said, July 2009. And four months after that, another quote from Erdogan. I went to Darfur myself and saw no genocide. Muslims don't commit genocide. This is November 2009. And four months after, another quote from Erdogan. Politicians cannot decide on genocides. This is the beauty of historians. So these are three statements on, on three different dates within a span of eight months only. And when combined together, these three statements would allow us to safely con conclude on, on the Prime Minister's behalf that uh, one, politicians other than Mr. Erdogan himself should not make judgments over genocide, a crime Muslims would never commit, but others, let's say the Chinese, can. And two, second result, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Armenians cannot amount to genocide, but the deaths of less than a hundred Uyghur Turks can. And three, genocide is something visiting dignitaries can see, actually, and if they don't, it means a genocide had not taken place. So how convincing this, this mental calculus can be a question I better leave to your judgment. But uh, this is Prime Minister Erdogan. I guess he subconsciously, like, like most Muslim Turks, uh, when I say Muslim Turks, okay, uh, officially speaking, 99% of, of Turkey uh, is Muslim. But uh, switching to Erdogan's understanding of Muslim, when I say a Muslim Turk, I'm referring to a devout, observant, uh, pious, very religious Muslim Turk, a very conservative uh, Muslim Turk. So subconsciously, this thinking is 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 about tolerating if if Muslims kill Muslims, uh, it wouldn't tolerate, but wouldn't at the same time turn the world upside down if, say, Christians kill Muslims. It would pra pragmatically ignore if two powerful Christians killed Muslims, like America's war in Iraq, 
But for some reason, again subconsciously, this, this mindset is programmed to turn the world upside down if Jews kill Muslims. So, this is a real selective thinking and, 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 and way of accusing other people of, of killing Muslims depending on the killer, identity, religious identity, not ethnic identity. So, yes, Turkey is changing, it has changed a lot, but I'll try to tell you so, uh, about the confused minds that most Turks had back in 2009, uh, based on the results of a reliable public opinion survey. So, these are the findings of a 2009 survey, two years ago. So, uh, the pollsters are asking the Turks who they think, which countries they think are the biggest security threats to Turkey. Number one, the biggest threat is, or was at that time, two years ago, the United States. Understand that. Number two, Israel. And I bet if the same survey uh, being done today, uh, Israel should have already made to the top. But anyway, two years ago, it went second as a threat, security threat to Turkey. Third biggest security threat to Turkey in the minds of the Turks was France. You might call it the Sarkozy effects or whatever. But then came uh, as security threats. Well, reasonably understandable. Armenia, uh, Queens and Russia. Uh, by all profile. <coughs> Three years ago, the, the top five threats in the top ten list were EU member states. France, Greece, Britain, Cyprus and Germany. And possibly to add some humor to their responses, uh, the Turks added these two countries to their top 20 threat list. Uh, they said these two countries were security threats to Turkey. Denmark, 11. <laughs> and Belgium, 14. So this survey also has, has revealed that they would all lose zero problems with neighbors' policy and this, this optimism had apparently found less echo on, on, on the Turkish public perceptions of threat because Turks at that time viewed five out of seven of their land neighbors, Greece, Armenia, Iran, Iraq and Syria, as threats to their country. The lucky two were at that time Bulgaria and Georgia. And if we consider the, the two geopolitical naval neighbors of Turkey, Russia and Cyprus, if we consider them also as neighbors, then the composition of friends versus foes around our country, according to Turkish perceptions, would be a stressful seven out of nine. So the Turks would consider seven out of their nine neighbors as security threats to their countries. So, the pollsters also asked, asked the Turks, Turks uh, which countries would be their best friends. And unsurprisingly, the top friendly country was Azerbaijan, which we say, you know, we are one nation, two states. Okay, uh, it's fine. But then, the list of Turkey's top 14 friendly countries included 10 from the Orient, and I'll name them for you. So they are Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Pakistan, Syria, Kazakhstan, Turkish Cyprus, Japan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and South Korea. So these are the friendly countries. Only two countries found a place on the top 14 lists, but from the EU. We only have two countries from the EU as our friends, but they come at the very bottom, Italy, uh, number 13, 
and Germany, number 14. So interestingly, uh, the top two top threats to Turkey, according to Turks, three years ago, are also the top two threats to world peace, because this was another question the bolsters asked the Turks. Who do you think is, which country do you think is the, is the biggest threat to world peace? So the Turks named, uh, again, number one, the United States, number two, Israel. Again, I would argue if the same question had been asked today, these could have interchanged their rankings. But uh, anyway, then we would see Russia as the third biggest threat to, to world peace in the eyes of the Turks. And then uh, France, yes, fourth. Uh, the fourth biggest threat to world peace, France. What else? The other top three threats to world peace in the eyes of the Turks were Britain, Iraq, that can be understood, but then Greece. And mind you, the question was not which country do you think is the, 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 the uh, biggest threat to the world's financial architecture. World peace was the question. Then came China and, and then North Korea you know, on a very intellectual level, I don't know. But uh, the funny thing here, here is that the Turks viewed at that time, and I'm sure they do today as well, the United States as top threat to Turkey, top threat to the world peace, and when asked which countries do you, do you perceive as friendly to Turkey, here we have the United States again. But not Israel. So, it's a kind of, I guess, Turks love and hate relationship with the Americans. But uh, then again, the two other countries fell into the same category, considered as security threats, both to Turkey and to world peace by the Turks and at the same time considered as friendly countries, and these were Syria and Germany. So, Germans are a threat to Turkey, a threat to world peace, but also a friend of Turkey. Then the, the picture really gets a little bit more complex, because another question asked at that time to the Turks was which country do you think would rush to Turkey's aid help? if Turkey faced a natural disaster or, or war with somebody else. It really gets complex. Because the country which the Turks would hope that would immediately rush to their help in, 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 in a case like that was again the United States. So top threat to Turkey, top threat to the world peace, a friend and the country who would rush to Turkey's aid immediately. I guess is well still today. And now, what is the picture today? Yes, here we have some more figures. The Pew Research Center's Global Attitudes Survey this year, 2011. Uh, only 36% of Turks who rarely pray. Turks who are not very religious uh, think that 
Erdogan has had a positive impact on Turkey. This is 36% of not really religious, uh, devout, observant Turks. But this ratio of approving Erdogan's policies, having had a positive uh, impact on Turkey, among the people who pray five times a day, very religious people, suddenly goes up to 67%. And the same study also found that Erdogan's government gets the best reviews among pious Muslims who pray regularly. And another survey separate from that has found that 65% of Turks approve Erdogan's foreign policy. And that's where the real danger is. Because as we can judge from the election results, Erdogan's party uh, got 50% of so there must be some 15 percentage points support for his foreign policy from non-AK party supporters. And we can guess uh, who they are. Uh, other Islamist parties, neo-Islamist parties, the national vision, whatever, and Turks who categorize, who identify themselves as, as nationalists. The Pew survey also found that only 4% of Turks, 4%, just 4%, have a favorable opinion of Jews. And 41% of Turks think Judaism is the most violent religion on earth. And only 9%, just 9% of Turks think that Arabs, Arab groups had carried out the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Only 9%. Which is an indication that probably most Turks think that 9-11 was a Jewish conspiracy. And there's, there's the, the social data supporting the political thinking of what I call in my columns the new young Turk. This is really the, the emerging personality whose uh, thinking we are trying to really analyze uh, here or there. But uh, again, a 2011 survey by a team of academics from Istanbul's Bahçeşehir University found that, uh, here we go, this is your new young Turk. 60% of Turks, both male and female, this question was asked uh, on a unisex basis. 60% say women should obey men. 33% think women deserve to be beaten. 44% think all restaurants should be closed during fasting times in Ramadan. 60% believe that we should be more, more religious facts in our lives instead of science. And 81% identify themselves as religiously devout. There are findings of some other polls that says, for example, this one found that only one third of Turks think that they share the same values with the Europeans. I think this is very fair. And 48 to 72 percent of Turks would refuse to have these as neighbors, gays, unmarried couples, Jews, Christians and atheists. And the last most recent German Marshall Fund survey found that Turkey is a NATO member with the lowest support for the alliance, which is at 37%. And there is a reason for that, and that reason is probably hidden in the answers to the next question. And the next question was the Turkish perceptions about potentially nuclear Iran. 38% of Turks are troubled about Iran becoming a nuclear power, only 38%. And 25% of them support Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left, but I have a few more th things to say that will divert us from the program. Uh, I'll try my best. So, uh, 
Okay. We know that in, in, in 2009 in, in there was uh, his increasing popularity encouraged everyone to, to not hide perhaps his, his uh, anti-Semitic genes and when he exclaimed in the face of Perez that he said exactly, you know how well to kill and that you there did not of course refer to Perez himself but to Jews. And then his repeated calls uh, that, okay, here's another quote from Erdogan, calling them and hear them is Hamas, calling them terrorists would be disrespectful to the will of the Palestinian people. Now, with that statement, he's aligning himself with an organization whose charter proclaimed in uh, 1988, uh, among other things, calls for the eventual creation of an Islamic state in Palestine in place of Israel and the Palestinian territories and the obliteration or dissolution of the state of Israel. So, an organization which officially has this as its goal is not a terrorist organization according to Erdogan. This is the thing. So, what happens if this is the case? And I'll tell you what happens. Uh, last year, the Ministry of Public Works drafted a bill presumably in an effort to, to ease restrictions and bureaucracy uh, on the purchase of property in Turkey by, by foreigners. The draft eases all restrictions on land purchases to lure foreign investment, but there's something sinister about it. It prohibits property sales in Turkey to Israeli and Greek citizens only, while favoring the Iranians, Syrians, Saudis and Gulf nations. Uh, by accepting them from a 99,000 square meter upper limit. So, this is the government to government side, legislation side, but the real longer term and more lasting risk associated with Turkish Israeli relations and Turkish perceptions of Jews in general is not in the government to government bickering or conflict, but rather about the sympathy more conservative Turks increasingly feel uh, for Erdogan's anti-Israel and fears for Palestinian rhetoric. The risk is, is about the systematic injection of, of, an is, of Islamic sentiments about Israel into the minds of younger ordinary Turks, uh, especially in the past two years and a half. I know diplomacy is about ups and downs and, and Relations can fluctuate from, from time to time, but public opinion here in this case, particular case, is, is, is often resistant to, to changing pre-coded images and, and prejudices. I'll give you a few examples, very recent examples. In 2009, and that's before the Marmara Mar 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 incident, a basketball game between Tur Telecom and, and Ney Hasharon was suspended in Ankara before it even started. During the warm-ups, Turkish fans threw objects at, at the visiting team's players and shouted, this is a basketball game, and, and, and fans, basketball fans, shouting that to the Jews and waving Palestinian flags. In 2010, and mind you, this was before the Mar 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 incident, as I told you. In 2010, a women's volleyball game in Ankara, again, between Israel and Serbian national teams, had to be played without spectators to prevent a kind of Turkish Munich, if I may say so. And it's in, in April this year, a group of Israeli cyclists was banned from a cycling tour in Turkey after the Syrian and Iraqi teams threatened to withdraw from, from the competition. And in May, again this year, a prominent Israeli theater company, Kameri, was forced to cancel a performance in Antalya because protesters planned to disrupt the in early June, an Istanbul concert by an award-winning Israeli musician, Yuval Bol, uh, was cancelled due to threats from the quote-unquote humanitarian aid organization which spearheaded last year's Mario Marmara Flotina. And also this year, uh, an Israeli jazz musician, Itamar Erez, and, and his ensemble were forced to cancel a weekend show in Istanbul due to threats from pro-Islamic uh, protesters. 
None of that was a coincidence, I guess. And, and in February, as you might well know, Polat Alemdar, the, the Turkish James Bond plus Rambo plus every other hero character returned to the theaters uh, with his Valley of the well, uh, Walls Palestine. And it, it, the film debuted coincidentally on the day after International Holocaust Remembrance. In the film, uh, this superhero character Alemdar emerges from a series of bloody clashes to track down and kill the Israeli commander who ordered the storming of the Marmara vessel. And it still makes me laugh really sorry, but in one particular the childish scene, uh, an Israeli soldier upon his arrival uh, in Israel asks this superhero character I learned that why he came to Israel. And he, he replies, I didn't come to Israel, I came to Palestine. And he's allowed an entry. The trouble is, box office figures show that in the first 20 weeks of its debut on January 28, over 2 million Turks, actually the number was 2.2 million, uh, watched this film, Valley of the Bulls, Palestine, making it the years third most popular film and generating over 10 million dollars in revenues. And these figures exclude private screen and DVD sales. I'm wrapping up in two minutes here. That's fine. So, uh, what does all that mean? It means, in my opinion, that uh, it should not be too difficult to guess that one of the young weavers of the film applauding the superhero character Alem Dar and cursing the bloodthirsty Israelis will become Turkey's prime minister in 20 minutes, 20 or so years or occupy the seat which today don't all occupies. We should be prepared for an ending like this. And sad, sadly with the social transformation Turkey has undergone, the marginal Islamist anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic, anti-Israeli, whatever you name it, this, this marginal Turk of the 70s has become, sadly, the average Turk in the year 2001. This is the average Turk. He used to be the marginal Turk 30 years ago, when I was play-acting in that theater. Okay. Uh, so, there is a reason, a very good reason, why we, when we're talking about uh, demonstrations in the Western world denouncing Israel's policy about this or that, that the protesters always chant political slogans. But there is a reason why in these anti-Israel protests among Turks or equally among Arabs, when they, when they protest, they protest by chanting Quranic hymns and Islamic slogans. So there has to be a reason why other protesters of Israel's policies chant political slogans, and these people chant religious slogans and hymns. There has to be a reason. And I'll tell you what that reason is. Uh, many people uh, may be tempted not to call a cat a cat, but I always tend to call a cat a cat. And the reason is that this is a religious war. It's not only political, it is a religious war. And one has to be an Islamist on this side of the map, not just a Muslim, an Islamist, which is different from a Muslim, to subscribe to it. What other conclusions can we reach? Uh, today, if you would ask me what any potential solution could be. I don't have a miracle panacea for that, because I don't see uh, better days in the future the foreseeable future, because reversing this hostile tide can take several decades and there is no reasonable indication why any reversal should take place. I have no idea. Uh, as for Europe, for the time being, the political cost of Turkish conservatism does not fall on Europe or risk doing so imminently, I understand that. That bill is today being paid by Turks like myself, who would happily live with Jewish, Christian, atheist, unmarried neighbors, uh, who wouldn't, who wouldn't, who
wish to see all restaurants closed during fasting hours in Ramadan. Uh, okay, we're paying the bill now to pay. You're not paying in Europe any bill, but that doesn't, or probably that won't keep you immune to paying that bill in the medium to long term because uh, linearly projecting the pace of Turkish conservatism into the next couple of decades. This is where we have come to in, in the last 35 years, as I try to visually show you with a few photos, uh, try to project that pace into ne the next few decades. And the picture you will have is a kind of, well, in which Europeans may not be lucky enough to avoid the vicinity cost which I call the vicinity cost of uh, having to live uh, next to a hundred million or so postmodern young Turks uh, who, you know, 90 plus percent of who would uh, favor a strictly dogmatic interpretation of basic Islamic teachings and feel religiously and ethnically hostile to their non-Muslim neighbors, Jews or Christians. Uh, that's all for me, thank you very much, and I'll be glad to, to answer your, your questions if you have any. Maybe let me start with one or two and then I will open up. Um, the overall impression I got and was a little bit pessimistic. Or the situation, let me focus on the first part, not so much the polls, but what you feel like our politics are right now. You, you told us that Turkey has enemies or it's, it's becoming problems, it's, it's getting problems with almost all the neighbors. I don't want to exaggerate and I know these similarities are always problematic, but we discussed that a little bit before and you said it's not that far off. We know about that Germany in the 30s, of course, got into fights with all the neighbors. And so, would that be a sign now that maybe something drastic could happen? That Erdogan getting strong, strong military, I don't care about my neighbors anyway, so I can start some kind of military conflict. Would you think that's, that's uh, likely? And can the international world do something against it? Uh, luckily, no, because uh, the only uh, Military risk Erdogan can dare to take today is like today's cross border or operations, military operations in, into northern Iraq or air raids to northern Iraq. But uh, when it comes to, let's say, a potential uh, armed conflict with, with Israel, with Cyprus, with Greece, you know, uh, we're not talking about a madman. And remember that the United States is the biggest stakeholder in this, still in this part of the world. I mean, when I say this part, not this part, but my part of the world, uh, say the Mediterranean, uh, I know that privately the Americans have, have seriously won Erdogan's men against uh, madness in the Eastern Mediterranean. And again, we're not talking about crazy people, neither Erdogan nor Davutoglu is, is, is a madman and they don't, at this moment, they don't feel that uh, they are prepared to, to completely abandon their abundance, uh, alliance with, with the United States. Mm. Yeah. Not yet. But then, if we talk about what happened today, and I know we may disagree on that a little bit. Of course, there was a terrible attack, 26 soldiers died. This is unexcusable. It's, I would say, also in a way, a terroristic activity. On the other hand, there are Kurdish people that don't have any nation. They have problems with Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. They are between a rock and a hard place. I would say somehow this should be solved. Can that ever be solved? In Turkey, the only response I see now is by force. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea, plan, how that could be solved? Or is it just the problem of the aggressive PKK and so on? I, I know those are not, not nice guys. It's a, it's a very complex matter, but first of all, we have to agree that uh, 
no matter from which organization or from whom comes violence of any sort against civilians or security forces, and, and, and our Israeli friends should be the best to understand the psychology, we have to be able to categorize it as, as terrorism, regardless of how justifiable it is. So if we tend to go into the roots of what is what is right and what is wrong, and if, if a certain case of terror should be justified because uh, because of its root cause, then we might be, you know, in a way, aligning with the terrorist mind. So the, the the thinking that okay, the Kurds, some Kurds are are are, are resorting to violence and terrorism because this is the only way they can express themselves, should justify the thinking that, okay, some Arabs or Palestinians are resorting to violence because this is the only way they can justify themselves. So we have to be very strict with this. Terror is terror, and the terrorist is a terrorist, no matter what his motives or, or, or reasons should be, or how, how justifiable his motives can be. But as for the, the second part of your question, I don't see an imminent solution to this very, very extremely complex pro problem because, uh, well, in the first place, I believe that the Kurds should have been uh, allowed to have their own uh, independent state at the beginning of the Turkish Republic, not after it was founded. Again, this also reflects one of the, the, the uh, short sightedness of the Turkish policy foundation of the Republic again. Uh, the Turks, including Ataturk, uh, they thought Jews, Greeks and Armenians should be the minorities because we don't share the same religion with them. But the Kurds should be the Turkish citizens because we share the same religion. So if you have this religion uh, based lens in making policy domestic or foreign, unmistakably you are wrong and you end up in a complex situation like that. Uh, I don't think any of these non Muslim minorities would have been violent as much as the PKK has been in recent years if they had been allowed the same rights as, as the Kurds. Kurds were treated in a very bad way. Uh, but they were first-class citizens of Turkey, unlike non-Muslim minorities. So, if you rely on faith as a common denominator, this is why you end up like 40,000 graves or so. It's a complex problem. It is a very complex problem. Mm -hmm. I, I will finish with one last question, then we'll open up. I have a little more prepared. We are running a little late. Coming back to the Middle East, to Israel. You mentioned, and we have discussed that within SPME, we wrote letters protesting against the airing or the opening of the movie Valley of the Wolves. And to me, what I heard about it, I didn't see it, it's clear that this is a, a, a really bad propaganda piece which tries, and I didn't know the numbers, 2.2 million, that's a lot. And then the kids tell their friends, and they play games, and it multiplies. So again, to me, there's this analogy. I mean, here in Germany, this whole propaganda was kind of invented and even was aired into the Middle East. That's another story. But to, to, to use mass media to influence. And then, so these polls now do not come as a big surprise to me. So now that the people are really manipulated, that to me is really disastrous. It's a big people, it's a big nation. And the opinions are so in, I would say, the wrong and one-sided direction. You as a journalist, is there any way to, to, to revert that? Or this must have implications on anti-Semitism and, and to the relations to Israel and, and not good consequences. Can you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, that's a very yes, as I, as I, as I think This is where I see the real danger in, in, in contemporary Turkish politics. Turkey is you know, moving uh, towards kind of a, a very bizarre kind of over self confidence and, and ethnic and, and, and religious conservatism. 
and when you combine these two elements, you have to create enemies to maintain your over self-confidence and, and kind of self-isolation. You have to have enemies. That's why Israel has, has been chosen to be the best nemesis. Uh, and you are right to think that I'm a pessimist, but judging from today's Turkish affairs, as I call them, what else would I have been? A pessimist. Because, as you said, 2.2 million, uh, mostly uh, young Turkish uh, boys and girls and watching this, and just like uh, some other people, some other time, wanted to be the Rambos or James Bonds or, or other heroes, they want to be, after having watched this, this film, they want to be uh, this volatile and that character who is fighting the, the bloodthirsty Israelis. And it would be a miracle if, if one of those 2.2 million, mostly young Turks, would not become Turkey's foreign minister or prime minister in 20 years, then it would be a miracle. Okay, um, I know there was an early, early question, so he should have the right for the first question and then the second one up there. Thank you, Mika, for all the technical help. It works pretty well tonight. Thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. My name is Monty Bogman, I'm an Israeli citizen and I have been living in now for the last 30 years and I've got a few questions to you. First of all, I'd like to uh, have your expertise on the question of um, about on the, an outcome that uh, although uh, Turkish uh, society was considered as a uh, by and large secular, something like 30, 40 years ago, I just recall and pointed uh, the pictures that you shown to us from your phone and so on. How come that this uh, Turkish uh, society shifted slowly, slowly towards religious society that supports uh, political parties like Erdogan's and politics like Erdogan's and Deva Torgu's. Uh, this leads me already to the next question, and that is, do you think that Turkey's close ties to Israel and to the Western world, I would say, and I would like to call it, Turkey's close ties, did they base on broad social support of Turkish society in the past, or did we fail to realize that these close ties were supported and by and based on quite narrow and small parts of the Turkish society that ruled and dominated the Turkish society, like the military, like Turkish political hierarchy, and so on. Maybe Next question. Two, 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 maybe two, two, two questions? Only two more, and that's it. I'm sorry. Very short. <laughs> very short. Um, okay. Then, uh, very important for me personally to know, um, what do you think does, how, how do you think does um, the Turkish military look at all this development, political development in Turkey within the last 10, 12, maybe even 15 years. And the next question is how could come that Turkish military, yeah, as we look at it or perceive it here in Europe, gave in or surrendered in the battle against Erdogan. This is like a very big, big, the 
disappointment, I'd like to have uh, your comments on this topic. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, there isn't a single answer or explanation for the shift you mentioned from uh, secular society into conservative society, but there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, my explanation is that what Atatürk did about a hundred years ago was to co only to postpone what the Turks would eventually like to, to, to have in their own country. So it was something unnatural, it was something imposed from the top by, by Atatürk. It wasn't something most Turks really wholeheartedly uh, wanted to enjoy themselves as being members of, of a secular uh, Western-oriented society. So it, it was something imposed on them. And eventually, they managed to break off with this unnatural imposition, if you, if you like. But uh, there is also a demographical explanation, which I, I, I subscribe to. And we were discussing, I guess, last night about that. And yes, you partly disagreed with me, but uh, I was discussing the same subject with a number of secular Turks. And they were asking me the same question. How come this happened? How come this happened? And my answer to them was very simple. I said, first, let's count how many households are we at this table. And we counted that we were altogether seven households. And then I asked the question, how many children were these seven households? And we counted and we said four. And among the others, uh, a group of seven households would at least have 30 children. And multiply that linearly projected, like a time series, exponentially they grow. And, and uh, when you have a secular family, they would grow their children in a secular and liberal education. Be whatever you want, think whatever you want, like my family did to me, or to, to the families of my friends did to them. But when you have this conservative Islamist family, it is out of the question, almost out of the question, with exceptions, that the children should stray away from the family line of thinking or conservatives. When you uh, start to cover the, the, the hair of your daughter at the age of four, as I showed you on, on some photos, or send your uh, sons to the Quranic schools at the age of five, it is almost out of the question that they should or they could stay away from this line of thinking. And when you uh, linearly project, uh, suppose this is 1929 now, and if you linearly projected this uh, together with the family education line, and the birth rates among different sections of the society, if you linearly projected that, till the year 2011. It is perfectly normal that you would have 50% support for a party that does politics on the, on the, on the, on the basis of religious conservatives. Maybe briefly on, on military, I think the next question was over here. Yeah, the military, I mean, they did not have any alternative because they would either have uh, intervened Could that have or stayed away from politics? And because of Turkey's EU bid to become a member, they were powerless. They, I think they did the right thing not to not to have intervened because Turkey was squeezed in between two unpleasant options. One was the undemocratic military intervention in politics, and the other one was the, the, the perfectly democratically elected Islamist rule. So I guess the military did the right thing, but they were helpless. Uh, in, in preventing this because it was, you know, if you look at the other 
military interventions in Turkey's history, 1960, 1971, uh, 1980, 1997. They had one thing in common, that behind all these interventions, there was a popular support. But for the first time, the military realized that they don't have a popular support if they intervened. So they stayed away from it. I guess for the good of the country, because I don't want to live under the, the, the governance of Islamists, but I would like to live under the governance of military leaders either. Unfortunately, it was rather dark about the perspectives in Turkey. I want to ask, um, I don't deny anything in what you said about the political, sociological background of Islamization of Turkish society. But of course, uh, Turkey at the moment and for the last years has been relatively economically uh, well-being and the boom. So, for me the question, and of course that has also led to people who might be more secular to say, well, they did the right job, they are, I don't know, they are not in their eyes so corrupt as the, uh, as the, region, as the governments before and so on. So, what happens when this economic miracle will end someday? Is that what will then be? Will, uh, will this mean it's, uh, it's the same um, with poverty or with well being? We want to be Islamists, or will there be an opportunity for renovated secular forces to launch a counter strike if there are still elections which can be said as democratic elections? Do you see any political forces which might be, which might lead to some hope for the future? Yeah, uh, I would answer in, in uh, this way. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got good news and bad news for you. I, I would respond to your question. The good news is that, it, let's say, uh, okay, in the first place, uh, not all of the fifty percent of Turks who vote for our party are Islamists. Or, or dangerously conservative people, not all of them. Actually, a good proportion, we cannot measure what proportion of, of, of that is that group, but we can safely conclude that a, a good proportion of our party voters are voting for our party for pragmatic reasons, such as the economic boom and, and the increase in the quality of their lives as they perceive it. You may agree or, or, or disagree with them, but I know many people from the uh, lower classes of the society, men voting for our party, who would otherwise think as secularly as I do, but voting for our party because of the improvement in health services, uh, government-sponsored housing, uh, infrastructure, business, everything. Okay, so suppose there's a very severely punishing economic crisis in Turkey tomorrow and there are elections the day after tomorrow. What happens then? Okay. I would say the AK Party's popularity would go down to, from today's 50%, it would go down to 35%. But then the question is, where would that lost 15 percentage points of votes go? To another Islamist conservative party. So, the good news is that our party depends really on trying to maintain this economic boom and if something happens financially, they would lose uh, a good portion of their votes. And the bad news is that those votes wouldn't go to a secular social democratic party, they would go to another right-wing religious Islamist conservative party. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, picture. I have a 
one provocative question and another more serious one. I'll start with a more serious one. Um, I lack logic in the Turkish approach to terrorism. It's been a very tragic day today, but it's not the first time. And how can the same politician be a friend of the Hamas and an enemy of the PKK, I, and the public, and the general public, doesn't see the lack of logic? And um, do you think that uh, Turkey is a, on the way to becoming an Islamic Republic of Turkey? or be an Ottoman, not an empire, but an Ottoman Republic of Turkey, uh, which would uh, implicate uh, the uh, power over the whole area and over the Arabs, which um, who never loved Turks, and it, it was on both sides lack of love. So I'm not wondering about the present lack of friendship between these countries and Turkey. The contradiction you very rightfully raised about the double standards of Turkey, I mean Turkish people's uh, perceptions about what is terrorism and what is not, is something uh, actually a column which I wrote a few years ago with the title The Great Turkish Hypocrisy. So you are right, it is the Great Turkish Hypocrisy. So uh, in this thinking, the PKK is terrorist. Again, in this thinking, I would have expected my, my nationals, uh, including some of my friends, to, to be consistent and honest enough to consider any terrorist attempt or activity or campaign as terrorist, any, in the world, Bolivian, Chinese, New Zealandian, or whatever. But no, this is not the case. The Turks suffered and complained about European double standards on telling what is terror and what is not terror for two decades. And now they are doing the same thing. For example, uh, these modest homemade rockets with which, which uh, Hamas says they are building modestly for peace, of course. Uh, we're talking about like, like 10,000 of them in, in recent years, uh, killing, including in 2004, a four-year-old child, Afik. Uh, so when this happens, your average girl would read it in the papers, and say, huh, okay, nothing. Because he would be embarrassed to open the support. But deep down in his thinking, he would feel, huh, they are our Muslim brothers, so they are doing the right thing. But when the PKK does the same thing, they are terrorists. Or when, for example, Chechen terrorists killed like more than 300 school children in Beslan, a few years ago, I guess it was in, in 2006, uh, they would only very shyly protest for the sake of protesting. But when you sat down and talked to them privately, they would tell you, yes, but you know, our Chechen brothers didn't have any alternative to it. So this is how I went a few years ago with this in, in my column with the title the great Turkish hypocrisy, because it is the great Turkish hypocrisy. Yes, we had the great European hypocrisy in these matters, but now we have the, the great Turkish hypocrisy. That's why I underline in my, my, my response to a question here that we must agree on a single definition of what terror is and what it's about, regardless of how much it can be justified. Terror is terror. And uh, your second question, no, Turkey will never become an Islamic Republic, but it will look like something in between what Turkey today looks like and what Egypt looks like. If that is an answer to your question. Of course, with, with the Ottoman aspirations. What does Egypt look like? <laughs> it's 
a big question, or what will it look like soon? No? Yeah. Let's move on in the order, let's move on. My name is uh, Christian Zimmermann. I only have one question. What is your opinion about the new GRP? Yes, is. is there a chance that she will become a social democratic party and uh, can change something? Yeah, I would say too little, too late. Uh, the CHP, the Social Democratic Turkish Party, they should have transformed reformed themselves 10 years ago, but they didn't. So they are partially responsible for the picture that we have today. But they are doing it right now. I approve what they are doing. They are really liberalizing themselves. They are really trying to uh, get rid of the old archaic thinking that made that party. But it's probably too late. So uh, there is this fierce dip pro-government columnist. Uh, a couple of days ago, I saw what he wrote in his newspaper and the headline was, even if Atatürk had been alive today and became the chairman of CHP, this party today wouldn't have gotten more than 20% of the vote. I think that is the reality of, of today. Uh, yes, they are on the right track. They are doing uh, many things to reform themselves. Uh, too little, too late. Yes, now the... Thank you for the lecture, it was very interesting. Um, we hear a lot about uh, Turkey shifting sides from a uh, Western camp to pro-Iranian Islam camp. Um, how about the claim that actually says, that mainly said, mainly supported by pro-government uh, supporters in Turkey, which say Turkey is not switching, switching, is not shifting sides. Turkey is actually promoting an independent foreign policy in which it can say no to one side, it can say no to the other side, and it is not, um, it is not bandwagoning itself with, with, neither, with neither, neither side. So, what is your, what is your answer to that? Well, I, I would name that policy as, uh, you know, the poet Lidgate's uh, famous line which says, uh, "You can." please some of the people all the time, or all of the people some of the time, but you cannot please all of the people all of the time. So this is what Turkey is trying to do, to please all of the people all of the time, which is not possible in, in foreign policy. Uh, but basically, their idea is that they, can, they think they can fool anyone. Actually, they can fool all of the people all of the time. This is their idea. By changing sides very often, shifting from one uh, block to another, uh, changing strategies, tactics, on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. But what they try to do is that they think if they zigzag, continues to zigzag between pragmatism and Islamism, they can fool everyone and all the times. And one day, I think, and I hope, that they will be reminded by outside forces that this cannot happen. Thanks. Um, first of all, thank you so much for your thought-provoking um, lecture. I would like to ask with all that you said, what would you and how would you consult our policymakers in the European Union and Germany, especially with the huge Turkish community that is not very well integrated uh, into our society? How to deal with Turkey? What policy should the European Union, what policy should Germany uh, follow uh, on Turkey? What should be done? What should maybe not be done? Um, that would be my question. Thanks. Right, okay. Uh, I'll try to uh, describe a metaphor, and maybe that will be an answer for you. I think, uh, in my metaphor, AK Party is doing a lot of Israel bashing, sometimes siding with, with, with Iran, uh, perhaps willingly or unwillingly helping out its nuclear program, siding with Syria. Uh, you know these are, as I, as I see them, rogue states. So, this 
is a kind of behavior that comes right from the hearts of the Islamists. So, suppose this is like an alcoholic going out to a bar and drinking every day. This is what his heart tells him to do. So this is my metaphor. Uh, normally, if you have a weakness to go out and, and have, say, five bottles of wine at a bar every day, that should have a cost for you. Financially, and in terms of your health, you may have a bad liver, whatever. Cirrhosis, whatever. So that is the cost that should keep you, uh, or that should provoke you to limit your drinking. And this is the real reason, the detriment to your desire to follow what your heart tells you to do. So if we apply this logic to, to, to our parties, continuous Israel bashing at this and that. It, it will give you a picture that this man goes to the bar and drinks every day five bottles of, of, of wine and rather than him paying the bill at the bar, somebody is paying him a hundred euros every night. And he has his health tests done the next day and he sees that his liver is a perfect shape. So until the moment they realize that there has to be a cost associated with their policies, they'll keep on doing this, following this guy. And going back to your question after this metaphor, uh, the EU used to be the soft power on Turkey. It had some sort of an influence. Uh, but with its policies to cope with the AK Party, uh, they have come to a point that AK Party really doesn't care about the EU or any soft power. So, if they are going to one day face the cost of the quality, like somebody reminding this drinker that he has to pay for what he has to pay, or uh, perhaps is they were not performing well anymore. It is not the EU, it should not be in the EU. But if you read the latest uh, progress report, it's too soft, too weak. I mean, no longer a soft power, not even a soft power. And what else? I don't know. The United States? I don't know. They have their own agenda with Turkey. Uh, but as long as this man does not face any cost, he will keep on drinking. You have to tell us now, Liz, Jonathan. <clears throat> Thanks for your um, presentation. Um, at the end, I'd like to refer a little bit to our last event, or, or the topic of our last event, which was about Syria. And uh, you know, it's, it's kind of shocking to think that the event was in, in uh, I think, in July, and it was about it was quite late. And uh, 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 after the Syrian uprising began, and it's really shocking to think that you know still people are, are fighting every day and dying every day and. Um, okay, that's, that's just one thought, but uh, back to Turkey. Um, despite all the negative things you said about Turkey, to, in my interpretation regarding Syria, there they played some positive role. At some point they, they got uh, tough against uh, Assad and it at least looks like they would support a regime change. Uh, in Syria, so um, what what can you tell us about the uh, Turkish agenda? Do you see any, um, on the one hand, any uh, positive uh, influences that uh, Turkey will have on, on uh, a regime change in Syria or, um, on the other hand, do you see any negative influence uh, by, for example, um, yeah, Turkey supporting, let's say, the Islamist uh, branch of the uh, uh, Syrian opposition. Yes, uh, I understand your optimism, but uh, allow me to remind you that even a broken clock would show the right time twice a day. So, uh, I don't mean to say that everything that party does is, is, is bad, of course, they are doing like intercepting uh, some uh, weaponry 
shipments, deliveries to, to Syria from Iran. Turkey did that twice and in, 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 in a very major way they did that. If you remember, both of them happened earlier this year. So I don't mean to say that uh, Erdogan and, 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 and uh, his friends in the cabinet, including Davut are actually physically helping out terrorists. No, it's in their political genes, maybe, maybe in their hearts, but when it comes to intercepting uh, illegal arms shipments, they do really intercept. And one of the reasons they agreed to, to, to deploy this NATO radar, knowing that, of course, the data coming from this radar will be shared by the United States with Israel. They agreed to that. This is, as I told you, zigzagging between uh, a pragmatist agenda and an Islamist agenda. So when they feel that for their survivability they have to cooperate with uh, the West, protecting Western interests, they will do that happily if they notice that this has to do with their survivability. So in this case, Syria specifically. Uh, first of all, they never really liked al-Assad because of sectarian reasons. You know, Sunni Turks view, uh, like Erdogan, they view uh, Shia and the, the Alevi faiths as uh, a corrupted, twisted version of, of, of Islam. So, being Shia, the Iranians and, and, and the Assad family in the eyes of people like Erdogan, are in the first place corrupted Muslims, not real Muslims. So, uh, deep in his heart, he would really feel sympathy for him. He tried to build a uh, working alliance with, with, with Assad on the basis of common interests, but apparently that failed. Uh, but the real reason why Erdogan came to the uh, popular Western line in asking for Assad's departure is that because he thinks Assad's possible uh, successes will be Sunni Islamists like him, with whom the Turkish government already has been in touch. Okay, I will take the liberty for the last question. If sure. you give a short answer, we will have a landing on time. And actually, it's a good thing. My question, I have the whole has also a little bit of an optimistic outlook. Turkey, Iran, when we think about it, to me, it's a big threat. If, if another power now, with a lot of nationalism, Turkey arises, being strongly against Israel, and if they should join forces somehow with Iran, then that whole region, I think, will be in, under bad forces. Now, what you mentioned, Sunni, Shiite, that may prevent that from happening. Is, is that, can you give us maybe, and I know many people are here from this talk, the bomb initiative, many people are very much involved in Iran. Can you, like, uh, make us a little relief that that will not happen, that, that maybe just some tactics now to be against Israel and to, in a way, join with Iran? Well, it's, it's a complex matter, again, because you have to, uh, try to understand the Sunni Islamist thinking, uh, which is that they would they would ally with the Shia if the enemy is non-Muslim. But if 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 it's an internal strife among the Muslims, they would ally with the Sunni against the Shia. So it depends on uh, what sort of alliances we're talking about. So uh, apparently. If you look at what Erdogan has repeatedly said in his verse, I'm quoting him, uh, the main obstacle to peace in the Middle East is Israel, he said many times. He doesn't say uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions or potential nuclear uh, weapons acquired by the Iranians would be uh, a trouble for the region. No, he says that. Iran, in fact, he implied that Iran has every liberty to, to develop its own nuclear bomb because another state, Israel, has already uh, 
nuclear weapon capabilities. So this is his thinking. Uh, here, is Israel is on his target, but on a Ceteris Paribus basis, if, 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 if we can take out Israel from the picture, he would then object to Iran acquiring nuclear weapons because it's a Shia state. So deep down, I know it's in the uh, it's in the hearts and minds of Erdogan and and and, and Davutoglu that if there is a there's going to be the second state in the Middle East that has nuclear weapons capabilities. It is not here, and it should be Turkey. I think this was a very interesting both Thank talk, you. lecture and discussion. And if you want, it's not over yet, we can continue. I will finish with two short announcements. And actually, I just saw that I omitted something. I left out something. Again, the next talks, the one, 17th or 18th of November, <coughs> And then the one with Richard Landis, who I know personally, who is a wonderful speaker. And this will be done with the Judicial Foster Group. We don't want to take the credit, it's a joint venture with the Judicial Foster Group, but it will be here. And the final thing, again, we thank you. And you may think this is wonderful. A Turkish journalist who, has, who is open minded, who has critical thinking. And you may take that for granted. And I looked at my note, I forgot something in his CD, and I apologize for that. And he told me that today at lunch. Burak Bektir was, because of one of his articles, he was sentenced to prison term, 20 months in Turkey. He got away, he did, it was, it was suspended, but because of his writing, he got 20 months in jail. So, he's taking risks, and he's with us now and again, I think that's, that's great. I want to point you also, he's doing a blog, he's doing a column twice a week. Please look into that, then you get first-hand information, and then we can all keep in touch. So thanks again. Thank